there is a big focus, of course, on that economic, those economic numbers, that sort of book that they put out that gives everybody the roadmap. But everybody is obsessed right now about this new leadership and what that communicates to investors around the world. Well, Romain, thank you for having me on. I'm <clears throat> delighted to know you remember our first encounter uh, back in the Jurassic era. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, th there will be understandable focus on uh, the growth target and the budget and monetary policy stance. But I think um, Tom is correct in signaling uh, a bigger issue here, which is the reorganization of Chinese governance. And I agree with <coughs> Uh, the bulk of what he said. The, the one thing that I would add to that, which I think is really terribly important, is that the power of governance under this reorganization is likely to shift away from the state council, which is the sort of the, the government structure of uh, the Chinese system, back to um, uh, the party, which is going to drive these new super large committees, working committees, focusing on uh, finance, uh, technology, innovation, and most likely security as well. Mm -hmm. So under Xi, um, we've seen uh, 10 years of uh, uh, growing concentration uh, of uh, party power under his singular leadership. Right. And this reorganization is likely to be uh, so, the latest step in, in, in that regard. Well, and I think that's very important for understanding the thrust of how China uh, will be move, moving uh, going forward, as well as China's well, uh, engagement yeah. with uh, well, a turbulent and contentious world. Well, talk about that engagement here, because I, that appears to be a worry of a lot of investors right now. The idea that for so many years China was opening up, it was sort of moving outward to the world. And there is some concern that they may be looking a little bit more inward, the idea that they can grow and they can prosper, kind of not completely independent of the rest of the world, but, not, but certainly not with the hard ties, those hard globalization ties that we have come to rely on. Well, I mean, you know, it's a fair point, Romain, but, you know, partly they're doing this by design, uh, but also by uh, reaction to a world that is really uh, putting uh, tremendous pressure uh, on China, especially uh, the United States, who has, uh, in the last five years, uh, launched a, a trade war, a tech war, and now the early stages of a new Cold War and the latest round of uh, export sanctions and... Um, uh, you know, the expanded blacklist or entity list squeezing Chinese companies uh, leaves them with little choice but to turn inward uh, to um, uh, develop the tools that they need <laughs> to hit their growth um, expectations uh, in the years and decades ahead. Well, Stephen, one of the arguments during the trade war that you just mentioned was that there's no way that China can thrive and grow without the American consumer base. And therefore, this is not the threat to American or threat on the competition front to a lot of American tech companies that a lot of people were worried about. What's your take on that? And now that we're talking about turning inward and growth decelerating, is this something that, say, American corporates like Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, need to be taking more seriously? Well, they, they are taking it seriously. Um, a, a lot of multinationals led by uh, Apple, who probably made the biggest uh, offshoring bet of any uh, U.S. Uh, headquartered multinational on China, they're starting to diversify uh, their offshore production um, by initially shifting some um, uh, iPhone capacity to, of all places, India, possibly Vietnam. Uh, small shifts initially, but, you know, hedging uh, uh, offshore exposure to, to China is, is certainly uh, a, an issue that is being considered actively in boardrooms of multinationals all over the world. But I just want to go back to the one point you said. It's not just that China needs the American consumer. The American consumer also needs uh, low-cost, high-quality production uh, from China, uh, and our <coughs> Treasury needs China as an important source of demand 
uh, for um, uh, uh, treasuries that uh, are required to fund outsized budget deficits. And finally, broadly based, U.S. manufacturers need China because it's our third largest and most rapidly growing uh, export market. So it's a two-way linkage that we have to be mindful of. It's not just one way that, um, you know, we've got China by the short hairs. Stephen, I'm glad you mentioned that, which brings me to just how much more we might need China with the labor market so tight within the United States as it is. Well, look, um, there's, there's a lot of um, pressure being put on uh, China right now by the U.S. Congress. I mean, I'm sure you uh, have covered uh, the first hearing of the new uh, House Select Committee on uh, China that took place um, earlier uh, this week. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to that and, you know, all the, uh, the pressures that are being brought to bear on China through Taiwan um, uh, and, you know, China's own contribution to those pressures, uh, the relationship is increasingly uh, fraught here. And, and so um, uh, it, it's hard to know if we have the wherewithal to pull back this inclination um, that we have for uh, conflict right now in the United States. Yeah. I find it very worrisome and the single largest uh, global risk probably uh, uh, for the next several years that uh, investors and uh, citizens should be mindful of.